Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new species of Spinosaur from Spain has just been named, a fossil forgery has been revealed, a new species of Ankylosaur has been described, and more. Starting off the news this week is the incredible story that astronomers have discovered the most luminous object in the universe, a quasar with a black hole in it that has a mass 17 billion times the mass of our sun. Quasars themselves have a pretty high luminosity anyway, and are found at the centre of many galaxies, powered by supermassive black holes in their centre. They have been known to outshine the rest of the stars in their galaxy combined, which, amongst other things, makes them able to be seen at the great distances they are often observed from. Naturally, the black holes that power them are some of the most massive objects in the galaxy. This particular quasar, as well as being 17 billion times as massive as our sun, pulls in a sun's worth of mass every day, adding this to its incredible mass. The researchers also said that this quasar could have the largest angular diameter occurring in this universe, but further observations will have to take place in order to confirm this rather fascinating potential discovery. Also in the news this week, some unfortunate news for polar bears. These mammals have long been the poster child of climate change with just cause, as the Arctic marine ecosystem is experiencing rapid declines in sea ice extent, age and thickness. Polar bears rely on sea ice as a platform to hunt their prey, primarily ringed and bearded seals. These animals give birth and wean their pups in late spring and early summer, giving a limited period of time for the bears to acquire the majority of their energy resources. This window of opportunity is getting smaller as the decline in sea ice extent increases. The polar bears are having to spend more time on shore, causing some polar bears to starve to death. Scientists conducted a study to determine just how bad it is for the iconic polar bear. The study collected data from 20 bears which consisted of both male and female, adult and subadults. The animals were immobilised and weighed and a GPS equipped video camera was placed on them. These were used to collect data on the time that the animals spent moving and what types of food they were eating. Blood samples were also taken to analyse their blood chemistry. They found that the bears used one of two tactics to survive an extended period on shore. Either they restricted their movements to conserve energy, or foraged for food such as berries. Unfortunately, neither of these methods reduced the predicted time to death due to starvation. This is pretty gloomy news for the polar bear. Try as they might, they are unable to adapt to a lack of sea ice. They need the calories obtained from the seal blubber to survive. First up in the paleo news this week, a paper has been published which has shown a fossil of a prehistoric reptile with supposed soft tissue preservation to in fact be a forgery. This specimen was first unearthed in the Italian Alps back in 1931 and was described in 1959, being given the name Tridentinosaurus antiquus. It was thought to be some sort of archosauromorph reptile that might be significant in working out the diversity of this major group of reptiles in the Permian period and the body outline around the skeleton was interpreted as the preserved remains of soft tissue. However, paleontologists had long been puzzled by the specimen, leading to this recent study that utilised techniques such as scanning electron microscopy, micro x-ray diffraction, and a series of other methods in order to determine the structure and origin of the body outline around the skeleton. The results of all these analyses showed that the body outline is actually not composed of fossilised soft tissues, however, and is instead a manufactured pigment. So this specimen had been painted to make it look like there was soft tissue preservation. Unfortunately, there is no record of the preparation or conservation history of the specimen, so it's not clear who was responsible for applying the paint or why it might have been done, but it would have occurred before 1959 when it was first described. The actual bones are genuine fossils, however, and the study encourages further research of the real fossil material using modern tomographic methods to see what it might reveal. So, an interesting study showing how modern techniques can be used to reveal historical fossil forgeries. This week has also been a particularly good one for new dinosaur species, with three being described in the last few days. Starting us off, a new species has been named from the very latest Cretaceous Age rocks in Morocco. It's a new kind of small hadrosaur and has been given the name Minquaria bata, coming from the Arabic for duck beak. The presence of hadrosaurid dinosaurs in the latest Cretaceous of Africa is actually somewhat of a surprise, since this lineage of dinosaurs is mostly known from North America, Asia and Europe, 
and before 2021 they were completely unknown from Africa, which would have been isolated from the northern continents at this time by seaways. However, in 2021 Ajnabia Odysseus was described from Morocco as the first hadrosaurid from Africa, and was interpreted as having crossed onto the continent by way of overwater dispersal, potentially through rafting. Minquaria comes from the same locality that Ajnabia did, and is represented by a partial skull comprising most of a lower jaw, part of an upper jaw, and the brain case. Interestingly, although the bones show signs of this being an adult individual at the time of death, it was very small for a hadrosaurid, probably about 3.5 meters in total length, similar to Ajnabia as well. However, a humerus and a femur are also reported that would have come from bigger hadrosaurids in the 6 meter range, suggesting at least three coexisting hadrosaurids here. Generally, these dinosaurs seem to be smaller than the North American and Asian hadrosaurids, which is suggested to perhaps be due to competition with titanosaurians in Africa. Additionally, the fact that hadrosaurids are so far unknown from Eastern Africa also presents the possibility that these Moroccan hadrosaurs could be a part of some kind of unique island ecosystem, where these hadrosaurs seem to have diversified and thrived right up until the end of the Cretaceous. The second new dinosaur of the week is a new kind of ankylosaur, described from rocks dating to the early part of the late Cretaceous of southeastern China. Named Datai Yingliangis, the fossil material known for this species is really quite amazing, with skulls and partial skeletons of two immature individuals that were found in association. These ankylosaurs were preserved lying on top of one another, with the skulls, neck vertebrae and parts of the limbs and armour all prepared out of a single block of rock. These specimens show a remarkable amount of detail, including loads of the individual small armour plates on the underside of the throat and neck, known as the gular osteoderms. And they also show a unique feature not seen in other ankylosaurs, double quadratadrugal horns, just underneath and behind the eyes, with a larger horn to the rear and a smaller one in front. All these anatomical details enabled paleontologists to thoroughly examine the evolutionary relationships of Datai, finding that it's intermediate between older Asian ankylosaurids and the more derived younger ankylosaurines, filling in a gap in our understanding of ankylosaur evolution. The paleontologists who described this specimen also suggest that the close association of two young individuals like this further adds to the hypothesis that juvenile ankylosaurs were gregarious animals and would form small groups. So some really interesting insight into ankylosaurian behaviour, as well as some beautiful new fossil specimens. And finally for the news this week, it's what you've all been waiting for. The third dinosaur named this week is yet another new species of Spinosaur, and once again, it's from Spain. Named Riojavenatrix lacustris, it honours the La Rioja region of Spain where the fossils were found, combined with venatrix, the Latin word for huntress. The species name lacustris comes from the Latin for related to a lake, as this is the paleo environment it would have inhabited. The fossil material known for Riojavenatrix is rather limited unfortunately, comprising a fragment of a back vertebra, parts of the pelvic girdle, and some bones from the hind limbs. However, the specific anatomical details of the bones allow it to be recognised as a Spinosaurid, and specifically a member of the Spinosaurid subgroup Baryonychinae, therefore being related to Baryonyx itself, as well as Suchomimus. However, due to the incompleteness of the specimen and the relatively poor preservation of the bones, its position among Spinosaurs is somewhat unstable. Rio Heavenatrix would have been a medium to large sized Spinosaurid, and is the first theropod dinosaur to be named from the Camaros Basin of Spain. Looking at the ages of the specific rock sequences that Rio Heavenatrix comes from, this appears to be the youngest known Spinosaurid so far found in the Iberian Peninsula, and is therefore also one of the youngest known Baryonychines. The fossils of this new Spinosaur were previously assigned to Baryonyx by past studies, but this new research naming it as a new species also reviews other Spinosaur fossils from Iberia and has found that all the fossil remains previously assigned to Baryonyx are in fact not from this dinosaur but other species. Therefore, the five Spinosaur species currently recognised from Iberia are Camariosaurus named in 2014, Valibona venatrix named in 2019, Iberus spinus named in 2022, Protaphylitis named in 2023, and the newly named Riojavenatrix. So the known diversity of Spanish and Portuguese Spinosaurids seems to be rapidly expanding, and we can probably expect more new Spinosaurs named from this region in the near future, hopefully from even more complete fossils. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, 
and we'll see you next time.